Welcome to class five of English 101. Uh, in this week's class, uh, we will continue focusing on the subject of verbs. And uh, before we move on into new territory with verbs, let's take just a couple of minutes to review what we've already covered. Verbs can be identified in four different ways. Action verbs, linking verbs, helping verbs, and state of being verbs. Action verbs, of course, show action. Linking verbs link the subject with another word in the sentence. Helping verbs are verbs that uh, are words that help verbs, uh, such as we are going. Are would be a helping verb. State of being verbs, uh, and we'll discuss those in just a few minutes, but state of being verbs are verbs that identify the subject with uh, another word in the sentence that identifies or renames the subject. Then we've also discussed that there are three types of verbals. We have participles, and participles are used in the sentence as adjectives. We have gerunds. Gerunds are used in a sentence as a noun. And then we have infinitives, and infinitives can be used as either a noun, adjective, or an adverb. We want to talk today about verb tense. Verb tense means time. The tense of a verb places the action at a particular time. In our English language, there are 12 tenses altogether. So because of this, we are able to be precise in explaining when something actually happened. I have a, just a simple sampling of all the 12 tenses here. The present tense is I eat. The past tense would be I ate. Future tense is I will eat. Then the present perfect tense, I have eaten. The past perfect, I had eaten. The future perfect is I will have eaten at some future time. Present continuous is I am eating. Past continuous, I was eating. Future continuous, I will be eating. Present perfect continuous, I have been eating. Past perfect continuous is I had been eating. And future perfect continuous is I will have been eating. The three simple tenses are the ones that we're going to focus on. Present tense, I eat at noon every day. Past tense, I ate at noon yesterday. Future tense, I will eat at noon tomorrow. Now, a couple of things that we need to keep in mind. When you're writing and you've selected one tense of a verb and you have another verb in that same sentence, don't change to a different tense in that sentence without good reason. For instance, if you begin reading or writing in the past tense, don't switch to the present tense. If you begin writing with the present tense, don't switch to the past tense. And here's just a simple example. William hit the ball and runs swiftly to first base. In this sentence, we have a switch from past tense to present tense. William hit the ball and run swiftly to first base. Well, it should be William hit the ball and ran swiftly to first base to keep the verbs in the past tense. Hit and ran are both in past tense. Let's give our attention now to regular and irregular verbs. A regular verb forms its past tense and past participle by adding either ed or d to the simple form. And I have several examples here for you to see to illustrate this point. On the left-hand column, we have just present tense verbs, type, cook, work, taste, and so forth. Then, 
for the past tense, we either add a D as in typed, since the word already ends in E, we would just add a D, or by adding ED, such as in cook, we would add ED to the word cooked. And so we have type, typed, cook, cooked, work, worked, and so forth through the list. Then when we change it into a present participle, we're going to add ing to the word. Type, typed, typing is the present participle. Cook, cooked, cooking. Cooking would be the present participle. Call, called, calling. And then the past participle, we would add the word having and use the past tense of the word. Having typed, having cooked, having worked and so forth through the list. So we have the present is just a simple word, type. The past, we add either D or ED, typed. Present participle, we add ING, typing, and past participle, having typed, something that has been done in the past, having typed, having cooked, having worked. Now, the regular verbs are relatively simple, but then we have a category that we call irregular verbs. Irregular verbs will not consistently add D or ED endings to the simple verb form. We don't do this to form the past tense or the past participle. Now, the problem is a verb's simple form doesn't offer any indication whether the verb is regular or ir irregular. So let's look at the word blow. We wouldn't say blowed and or blow and blowed. We would say blue or blown. The word began. It would not be began, but it would be began or begun. The word break, we wouldn't say break, but we would say broke for the past tense and broken for the past participle. Drink, we would not say I drank a drink yesterday. We would say I drank a drink yesterday or the past participle, drunk. The word grow. We would not say he growed an inch over the last month. We would say he grew an inch or he has grown an inch over the last month. And you can see with all of these irregular verbs that we just have to learn the tenses uh, from the simple form because these are irregular and will not be changed just simply by adding D or ED or ING for the past participle. Another category of verbs is intransitive and transitive verbs. An intransitive verb will not require an object to complete the verb's meaning. I sing, that's a sentence in and of itself. I pray, they slept, Joe laughed. All of those are complete sentences because they have a subject and a verb and they complete a thought. A transitive verb, on the other hand, does require an object to complete the verb's meaning. I need a guitar. You would not just simply say, I need, or I found, or they want. We have to have an object to complete the verb's meaning. I need a guitar. He saw a star. She bought a car. So transitive means that we have to have an object, having or taking an object. So let's look at a few examples of intransitive and transitive verbs. A couple of words that sometimes cause a great deal of difficulty in using them correctly 
are the words lie and lay. Lie is an intransitive verb. It does not need an object. It means to recline or to rest. And the forms are seen here. The simple form is lie. The S form is lies. The past tense is lay. The present participle is lying. And the past participle is lane. Now here are examples. The simple form, the hikers lie down to rest. The S form, the uh, he lies down to rest every afternoon. The past tense of lie is lay, and this is where some confusion comes in, because if you look over to the next list, you'll see that on the word lay, the simple form is lay, whereas the past tense of lie is lay, which can indeed cause some confusion. But again, let's go back to the word lie. The hikers lie down to rest. He lies down every afternoon. The past tense is lay. Yesterday, I lay there thinking. The present participle is lying. He is lying on the couch. And the past participle is lain. I remembered that I had lain there. That is the word lie. It does not need an object. It is an intransitive verb. Now, let's give consideration to the word lay. Lay is a transitive verb, which means it will always need an object. It means to put something down. The simple form is lay. The hikers lay their backpacks on a rock. Now, notice the difference between lie and lay. The hikers lie down to rest. But an action word, the hikers lay their backpacks on a rock, is something they did. They put something down. The S form is lays. He lays his backpack there every time. Compare that to lie. He lies down to rest every afternoon. He lies. He lays. Past tense of lay is laid. Yesterday, he laid it on a lizard. Laid. Present participle. He is laying it on the rock carefully. Past participle is laid. He remembered that he had laid it down. So again, the different forms of the words lie and lay, lie being intransitive and lay being transitive, lie not needing an object, lay having to use an object to make sense. Let's give consideration to a couple of other confusing words. Let's think of the words sit and set. The verb sit means to be seated. Sit will rarely ever require an object. Let's sit near the front. The monkey sat on the limb. They are sitting in the shade. We have sat here long enough. But now let's compare that to the verb set. Set means to put or place something, and it will usually require an object. Set the bowl on the table. They are setting the props in place. Ivan set his guitar on the floor. They have set the date for their wedding. Sit means to be seated. Set means to put or place something. And see the difference. One is transitive and the other is intransitive. Another example of a word or two words that are sometimes very often confused are the words rise and raise. The verb rise means to go up or to get up, 
and rise never requires an object, whereas the verb raise means to lift something or to push something, and raise usually will require an object. The dead in Christ shall rise first. All believers will be rising to meet the Lord. Christ died and rose again. He has risen as he said. Now, we could reword all of these sentences. The dead in Christ shall rise. We can leave the word first off because it's not necessary for the sentence. The sentence, the dead in Christ shall rise, is a completed sentence with a completed thought. So it has no object. All believers will be rising. And then there's an addendum there to meet the Lord in the air, but will be rising. All believers will be rising. Christ died in rose. Again is a word that's just added for information, for explanation, but Christ died and rose. He has risen. But now let's compare that with the verb raise, which means to lift something or to push something. We raise the windows every morning. Now, just simply saying we raise doesn't make any sense. We need to know what we are raising. We raise the windows every morning. We are raising vegetables this summer. We are raising, raising what? Well, we have to have an object. They raised the sunken ship. And again, they raised has to have an object to let us know what has been raised. And my son has raised an ant colony. And again, we have to have an object to give explanation to the verb has raised. Now let's turn our attention to voice, the voice of a verb. Voice is either active or passive. Voice tells whether a subject acts or is acted upon. A subject with an active voice verb performs the action. Most clams live in salt water. They burrow into the sandy bottoms of shallow waters. A subject with an active voice performs the action. Most clowns live in salt water. They burrow. So they are living and they are burrowing. Those are the active voice verbs. A subject with a passive voice verb receives the action of the verb. So we need to understand that verbs in the passive voice use forms of be, have, and will as helping verbs with the past participle of the main verb. A couple of examples. Clams are considered a delicacy by many people. Now, clams in this sentence are not doing anything actively. Clams are being considered by many people. So the clams are not doing anything they're receiving the action of the verb. Some types of clams are highly valued by seashell collectors. Are valued. Clams are valued. It's not something that they're doing themselves. It's something that is being done to them. They are being valued by seashell collectors. So, active voice means that the uh, the subject is doing the acting, and a passive voice means that the subject is receiving the action of the verb. In these four sentences, what I want us to do is change the following sentences from a passive voice to an active voice. Consider the first sentence. An enormous fortune was earned by Nobel when he invented dynamite. An enormous fortune was earned by Nobel when he invented dynamite. How would we change that from the passive voice to the active voice? We would simply say Nobel earned an enormous fortune when he invented dynamite. So, an enormous 
fortune was earned by Nobel. The enormous fortune in that sentence is not doing any acting. An enormous fortune was earned. So enormous fortune, the subject, is in the passive voice. But when we turn the sentence around and make Nobel the subject, Nobel earned an enormous fortune when he invented dynamite, then we have changed it from a passive voice verb to an active voice verb. It's the same word, but it changes from passive to active. Look at the second sentence. An avid inventor, over 300 patents were held by Nobel. Again, let's change that from the passive voice to the active voice. An avid inventor, Nobel held over 300 patents. Now let's compare the two sentences. An avid inventor, over 300 patents were held by Nobel. 300 patents. Patents is the uh, uh, the uh, noun and uh, the verb is were held, but the patents aren't actually holding anything. They're being held by Nobel. So that's a passive voice. When we change it to Nobel held over 300 patents, Nobel is the subject and held is the verb and Nobel is doing the acting. He is holding over 300 patents. Number three, Nemesis, a four-act play, was written by Nobel shortly before his death. Okay, Nemesis, and we have an positive there, a four-act play, identifying what Nemesis is. Let's just take the a positive out for a moment. Nemesis was written by Nobel shortly before his death. Let's change that to the active voice. Shortly before his death, Nobel wrote Nemesis, a four-act four play. We could actually reword it again. Nobel wrote Nemesis, comma, a four-act play, comma, shortly before his death. But it's Nobel now who is doing the acting. Nobel wrote. So it changes from passive to active. Now let's consider the last sentence there. Beginning in 1901, people who work in physics, literature, chemistry, and world peace have been honored by the Nobel Prize. So how would we change that from the passive voice to the active voice? Beginning in 1901, the Nobel Prizes have honored the people who work in physics, literature, chemistry, and world peace. Peace. The Nobel Prizes have honored people. So we change it from the passive to the active. Just remember that active voice means the subject is doing the acting, and in the passive voice, the subject is being acted upon in some way. Now quickly, let's review what we have learned in our study of verbs. Verbs show action. This can be either physical action or mental action. He ran. He thought. Physical action, he ran. Mental action, he thought. Linking verbs link a word in the predicate to the subject. Helping verbs help the main verb make a statement. A verb phrase is a main verb and its helping verbs. A verb phrase is sometimes interrupted by adverbs. He will gladly accept a challenge. He will never leave you alone. Gladly and never in those two sentences are adverbs. The subject of an interrogative sentence usually interrupts the verb phrase. Where does discouragement come from? 
Discouragement is the subject in this interrogative sentence, and it interrupts the verb phrase does come. Then we considered three verbals. A verbal is a verb form used as a noun, an adjective, or an adverb. Number one, participle, used as an adjective, and it ends in ing, ed, d, t, e, n, n, or n, e. Some examples of participles would be swim vest. Swim is an adjective identifying the vest. Dealt a bad hand in life. Dealt is a participle. Crying baby, an adjective describing baby. Burning log. Now, gerund, the second verbal form, is used in the sentence as a noun. But notice now that we can use the same words as we do with participles. Swimming is fun for all ages. Swimming would be the subject of that sentence. It's a verb word, a verbal word, swim. But in the sentence, it's used actually as the subject of the swim, a sentence, swimming is. So it's a gerund. It's being used as a noun. Enjoy swimming. Tom and I enjoy swimming very much. Swimming here is also a noun. It's, it's, a, it's something. It's a thing in this sentence. Traveling was. Traveling in a sentence can be used as the subject. Traveling was very enjoyable as we viewed all the scenes. Traveling. And then the third verbal is an infinitive. Infinitives can be used as noun adjectives or adverbs. To go to church. One must practice to play. The tourist wanted to leave. Now notice in all three of those, we have the word to. In some sentences, the word to is going to be a preposition. It's according to how the word is used. If it is a verbal form, if it's acting in some way as a verb, then it's going to be an infinitive. To go to church is. One must practice to play. The tourist wanted to leave. We then gave consideration to regular verbs. A regular verb forms its past tense and past participle by adding ed or d to the simple form. Type, typed. Cook, cooked. Work, worked. Call, called. Irregular verbs do not consistently add ed or d to the simple form to form the past tense and the past participle. And we looked at some examples. Blow, blue, blown. Begin, began, begun. Break, broke, broken. And the irregular verbs pretty much just simply have to be learned because they cannot be formed by the regular method of adding ed, d, or ing. Transitive and intransitive verbs. An intransitive verb requires no object to complete its meaning. I sing, I pray, he ran, they slept, she cried, Joe laughed. On the other hand, a transitive verb requires an object to complete the verb's meaning. I need a guitar. They want a pizza. Joe dropped his coffee. It needs an object to complete the verb's meaning. So transitive and intransitive verbs. We gave consideration to verb tenses. And again, there are 12 tenses in the English language, present, past, future, present perfect, past perfect, future perfect, present continuous, past continuous, future continuous, present perfect continuous, past perfect continuous, and future perfect continuous. 
And we also learned that the three simple tenses in English are present tense, past tense, and future tense. This now brings to a conclusion our study of verbs, and you are now ready to take your midterm exam. Your midterm exam is going to uh, cover everything we've covered in the first four weeks, and we hope that you will be able to complete that very quickly. It's just going to be a simple matter of writing sentences as you have been doing for all of your weekly assignments. Uh, this time they will be judged and uh, graded according to your ability to write the sentences using all the different types of uh, uh, words that we have learned. We have talked about nouns and pronouns and verbs. And so we will look at those three parts of speech and you'll be given the opportunity to write sentences in each category that we've looked at. And then uh, next week we'll move on into another of the parts of speech. I hope you have a great week, and I'll look forward to being back with you next week as we continue our study of English 101.